So Trevor, you were the very first person to hear Eisenhower's D-Day speech at the BBC. Yes. Um, that took place at uh, 200 Oxford Street, which had been Peter Robinson's department store. A broadcasting house um, at the beginning of the war, or early part, had been bombed. So the government and the BBC decided that they would commandeer a building uh, that had several stories underground. And the building they commandeered had been uh, Peter Robinson's department store. And now the studios were underground. In fact, we had to walk up. We were below London sewage level. Uh, and at the lowest part, we had to walk up a full story to spend a penny. Well, on this occasion, on June the 6th, 1944, I'd been on night shift and I was just preparing to go home when the head of presentation uh, phoned my boss and said, oh, will you tell Hill to get to the news studio ready? And uh, a BBC announcer will be arriving shortly. So I thought, oh, well, I wonder what's happened. So I went and uh, instead of catching the tube and going home, I went and got the news studio ready. And then I was told that there'd be a dispatch rider coming from Bushy Heath. Now I knew that to be General Eisenhower's headquarters in the United Kingdom. And I went out onto the balcony of, it was the street. It was raised above the street level slightly, about a car height. And I stood outside watching to see when somebody arrived and I saw this lovely American, heard this American motorbike coming up Oxford Street and thought, wow, wouldn't I have a ride on that? Anyway, the rider stopped and uh, looked up and I gave him a thumbs up sign. Yes, you're coming here. And he came up the steps with a package which he brought into the building, and Mr. Chegg Whitten, the assistant head of BBC presentation overseas, signed for this package and said, Hill, take this to the news studio, take level on it, and John Snag will be shortly arriving. So I took the package, looked at the American beautiful motorbike, thought, wow, I'd love one of those, went down to the studio, undid the package and there was a disc recording, acetate, and the label, I hadn't seen a label like this before, it said AFRS, Armed Forces Radio Service. I thought, whatever they are. Anyway, on the TD7, which was the BBC record players, uh, you didn't just pick a pick up up and lower it because in case you were doing this, you had a handle and a vernier control and you lowered the pickup and then you turned the vernier back just one groove and then it was all ready to lower down and the disc played and to get level on it I lowered the pickup, looked at the program peak meter turned up the volume and I heard this voice say people of Western Europe Today, we have landed on the beaches of Normandy. Wow. I thought, gosh. Well, actually, we hadn't landed on the beaches of Normandy because the weather wasn't good enough. D-Day was delayed. From the broadcast point of view, it was about three hours, 54 minutes. And I waited in the news studio and suddenly... Laurel and Hardy turn up. Well, a tall fellow and a very robust person. And I discovered they were from MI5. And they were there to make sure that Hill didn't speak to any member of BBC staff. I wasn't allowed to ring my mother and say I'd been delayed. I was going to be late home. And after they'd been there for two hours, I said, well, I'm sorry, but I just have to visit the gents. To my embarrassment, it wasn't Hill alone who visited the gents. <laughs> I had Laurel and Hardy inside the loo with me, which I found rather embarrassing. But 
short enough, our BBC announcer turned up and three hours, 54 minutes, I think, later, the announcement came. People of Western Europe, today we have landed on the beaches of Normandy because by now the landing had taken place. Well, John Snag was the BBC announcer. I'd worked with John on the overseas service and uh, we were both, you know, thinking, wow, what marvellous news. Uh, shame that it had to be delayed, the announcement. I thought, well, this isn't a BBC record, but I'll put it up in the record rack above the turntables, the TD7s, as they were called. Three days later, I uh, was back on now day shift and went into the news studio and suddenly saw there was the record still there. I thought, oh, this is very odd. So I waited a couple of days, it was still there, and then I walked down Regent Street to the Broadcasting House. That had been bombed in the early part of the war. And took it to the library, and the librarian looked at it and said, well, thank you very much, but this is not BBC property. Extraordinary. So I thought, right, um, I'll take it home. So for quite a few weeks, Eisenhower's recording was in the attic of my parents' home at 23 Holmwood Grove Mill Hill, North West Seven, until several months after D-Day, E. St. Clair Hobbins, my splendid boss, wanted to find out where was the D-Day recording. And a lovely Armenian lady, a young lady we had, called Veronica Mnukian, and she was very, very lovely, was Veronica. She said to my boss, I bet it's that Hill Hill. Mr. Hobbin said, Hill, do you happen to have the D-Day recording? Uh, yes, sir. You will return it immediately. Uh, yes, sir. Of course, sir. Naturally, sir. Mm. But before I returned it, I took it down to our own disc recording people and I said, you make me a copy of this. I said, this is the only recording of Eisenhower without any announcer or anybody else, because it's the original. I said, I want two copies, one for John Snag, because he made the announcement, and the other one's for me. And that's what happened. So you were the custodian of, um, of that recording for quite some time, Trevor. Not of the original, I gave the original back, but I had... I still have my copy, and the late John Snag, um, the last time I spoke to John, he still had his original, besides the recording of himself with his voice announcing. And it was in 19, I think, 91, um, I had retired in 83, having had a heart attack. Um, in 91, I got a call from America they wouldn't tell me who they were, but they said, we understand you may have the original D-Day recording. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, yes, if you have, and it is the original, we will be prepared to offer you a sum of perhaps 30,000 pounds. I said, 30,000, yes. I said, if I did have it, I wouldn't sell it to you. It wouldn't be mine to sell. But I don't have it. But thank you for asking. And 30,000 would have been nice. During the war years, Trevor, you had quite um, an encounter with um, Field Marshal Montgomery, I believe. Uh, yes. Um, well, we were never told, of course, who was coming in uh, for security reasons to broadcast. But on this one occasion, uh, I was told that a certain person from the War Office was going to come to broadcast and I got the studio all ready 
and um, there was no BBC producer uh, with me at the time. He came down later. And I heard quite a few footsteps coming down the corridor leading to the news studio and the recording channel next door at 200 Oxford Street, Peter Robinson's old building. Well, had been their store until it was commandeered because it was had three stories underground for security, safety reasons. And it was um, a day when uh, I was attending that evening, going to attend the BBC Home Guard. Being the youngest member of the BBC Home Guard, I was the company runner. They probably thought I was the fittest because I was the youngest. Anyway, I heard these footsteps coming down and looked out into the corridor and I thought, gosh, I know that gentleman, I stand to attention. It was Field Marshal Montgomery. And with him was an entourage of brigadiers, colonels, and they all walked into a little control cubicle, which was about the size of a normal loo. And I said, excuse me, gentlemen, uh, but you can't all uh, come in here. This is, you know, just a news studio. There's not room. And the field marshal looked at me and said, what's your name? I stood to attention. I said, it's Hill, sir. Hill. I put a, an arm on my shoulder and said, quite white, Private Hill, quite white. I realised Montgomery could not roll his R's. R's. <laughs> Now, I'm to understand that you had quite an experience with the famous J.B. Priestley, Trevor. Ah, yes, now, thank goodness, in wartime, we had John Boynton Priestley, and he came to 200 Oxford Street, which was our overseas service of the BBC, in Peter Robinson's original building, uh, which the BBC had commandeered because it had three stories underground and the Broadcasting House had been bombed earlier on. And J.B. Priestley used to come and do a weekly series called Britain Speaks. Mm -hmm. Or, as some of my colleagues would say, Priestley Spouts. But I became a great admirer of John Boynton Priestley. Uh, I discovered that... A lot of people discovered he was rather left-wing, not quite conservative that uh, Lord Reith had been, <laughs> uh, but his stories to overseas uh, I thought were absolutely marvellous. And he'd see, say things like, um, I've been told uh, that Herr Hitler and not by a friend of his, because that little man doesn't happen to have any friends. <laughs> that was JB. Uh, I thought he was terrific. And I thought, gosh, he's cheering us up. You know, those who are listening to the BBC overseas, how marvellous that they can listen to JB Priestley with what he's saying. Yes, a bit left wing perhaps. Well, on this one occasion, I would got the, the studio ready for him. He liked a glass of water on the right-hand side of his small table, the microphone here in the middle, and on the left-hand side were headphones, because he liked to put the headphones on and listen to his own voice coming over the microphone. So everything was ready, and uh, I got the studio ready, and then I hear footsteps coming down the corridor and uh, Priestley comes in, he's got a, a rather tattered Mac, so I help him up that off, put it on the coat hanger and his rather tattered Trilby, hang that up, then I open the inner and outer studio door, he walks in to the studio, sits down at the table, takes a sip of water, puts the headphones on and looks up and then I turn to point nine on a ring main, we have a talkback system, one 
was the home program to the forces, etc. Eight was local studio, nine talk back to recording. And we were recording Priestley. So I come back, sit down, press the talk back, say, hello recording, uh, JB Priestley, Britain Speaks. And the voice at the other end says, good God, is that old gas bag in again? As I look up, Mr Priestley is taking his headphones off. He bangs open the door, picks up his hat and his Mac and says to me, I don't come to British Broadcasting Corporation to be called a gas bag. Good day. <laughs> I thought, oh, Hill, it's the end of your career. You're out. You <laughs> damned idiot. I'd left his ring main on point nine instead of point eight so he listened to recording referring to him as a gas bag so he wanders down the corridor now wartime anybody coming in to bbc had to have a pass to get in and a pass to get out and mr priestley was in was so annoyed at what he'd heard I heard the security man say, yeah, well, I know you're Mr. Priestley, Mr. Priestley, but without your pass, I can't let you out of the building. <laughs> and, and Jack is... Up. Fortunately, while Mr. Priestley is trying to find his pass, a member of staff, senior member of staff, I see, and I rush up and tell him what's happened. I say, oh, sir, he said, he said uh, oh, gosh, he said, very unfortunate. Leave it to me. And I just hear him trying to calm down. And Mr. Priestley is rah, 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 rah. and my colleague is saying, yes, of course, but blah, 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 blah. anyway, Mr. Priestley comes back. And I thought, well, that's the end of me. I'll get the sack this week. And uh, he hangs his own coat on, puts his hat on, opens his own studio door and sits down takes a sip of water, looks up, glares at me, and I say, what well, my ring mean? Uh, recording, um, J.B. Priestley, uh, Britain Speaks. Uh, I'll just ask Mr. Priestley to say a word or two for level on his voice. I look up, and Mr. Priestley is sitting back, and he leans forward towards the microphone, and he says, I've been a bit of a booger. <laughs> In later times, now I'm sort of a programme engineer as a producer for the BBC, I produced several adaptations of Priestley's books and they were broadcast worldwide. And as a result, I was most honoured to be made a member of the J.B. Priestley Society and I have lifelong membership, thanks to John Boynton Priestley. Now, there was a very interesting and amusing story about Sir Laurence Olivier that you can tell us, Trevor. Yes, um, I did a series for the BBC in the north of England called Showcase, and it was review of film and theatre. And I had Michael Walsh of the Daily Express. I had John Stratton of the Manchester Evening News. They would do most of the interviews for me. Occasionally, when they weren't available, I would do the interview myself. I was SNF, staff no fee, because I was employed by the Beeb. We had to pay Michael and the others. And on this one occasion, neither were available and Tommy Appleby was the manager of the Opera House Manchester. He was a superman, a star in his own right. And he explained to me, he said, um, have I told you if you come here to do an interview with anyone who's appearing on stage, the BBC don't have to pay. It's part of their contract with us that they can be interviewed by the media. And I said, no, I didn't know that. So he said, well, he said, uh, you mentioned Sir Laurence Olivier, you'd like to interview him. So he said, come and do so. 
So I think very carefully about what I'm going to ask him and I turn up and I do the interview with him. And when it's all over, I think to myself, this is a little unfair. Um, he's spent quite a long time listening to me, asking him questions. Um, and yet, you know, the BBC aren't paying him. So on the way from the Opera House, I call at Dingley's of florists in Manchester. And I know the manageress, and I say to her, you don't happen to know what flowers um, the Olivier is like. And I said, I'm thinking of uh, Sir Lawrence's wife. And she said, yes. She said, as a matter of fact, she said, we've supplied quite a few lilies of the valley. So she said, well, come in. So I went in, and they had long baskets. And there was one basket about four feet long. And I said, would you fill that with lilies of the valley, please? I said, they're staying at the Grand Hotel Manchester. I said, if you will have that delivered, it's just round the corner from you. And I said, and would you put in this card? And the card was from me to Sir Lawrence and his wife, thanking them for the time they spent in the interview I'd done with them. A little later, I got a call, it was the next day, and Vivian Lee said, we were just going up to our room at the hotel, and I said to Larry, I can smell lilies of the valley. And he said, now come on girl, or something like that. She said, well I think I can. She said, when we walked into the room, there was your lovely, lovely present. And she said, it was so very kind of you, Mr. Hill. We would like you um, to come and have a meal with us. So I'm invited, and it's a lunchtime. And I go to the Midland Hotel, and I've, my wife says, now you've got to put your best suit on and everything, and you know, go and have a haircut and make sure you're looking you know, as you should. So I turn up, and uh, we have a meal, and it's just finished when the phone goes and the hotel says, oh, there's a visitor wanting to see Sir Lawrence Olivier. And he said, well, I'm just entertaining somebody from the BBC. And I hear him say, oh, well, very well, but will you tell them that we are slightly engaged and uh, it'll be rather short. Two or three minutes later, there's a bang on the door and uh, he goes to open it and there's this lad who is dressed in a, a very long mac and a trilby hat. He hasn't taken the hat off in the hotel. And he says, Mr. Olivier. I think, what is this? Is this some joke? And this is a lad from a local paper and the paper have allowed him to come to interview Sir Lawrence Olivier, and he comes in, his hat's still on his head, he's got a, a big uh, sheet of uh, several papers and a pencil, and he licks a pencil, and sits down, and Sir Lawrence looks at him and says, now, um, how can we assist? And this voice says, and I just can't believe it, have you done any films? I see Sir Lawrence's face and Vivian Lee's. She leans forward as much as say, did I hear correctly? Has Larry done any films? <laughs> uh, uh, he said, oh, well, yes, I, I have, as a matter of fact. He said, I know you're on stage at Opera House. Uh, what sort of films have you done then? I thought, I just can't believe this. And as this questioning goes on, I notice that his wife gets up and she goes to the curtains of this sitting room and she's sort of fiddling with them as if she's trying to sort of draw them together to keep the sunlight out. But her shoulders are going up and down. She can't stop laughing. <laughs> I don't think it's at all funny. I think, how can the paper go and allow them to send an ignorant little so-and-so like this to interview 
two of our best stars in the country in film and theatre. <laughs> anyway, the questioning goes on, and he's still say, he's still chewing, licking the pencil, making notes, and saying, "Well, ta, I'll be on my way then." And Vivian Lee bangs the door shut. She turns around, leans against it. I suddenly see Sir Lawrence. He's patting his chest and everything and says, uh, Mr. Hill, you wouldn't happen to have a cigarette, would you? I said, yes, I do. So I gave him a cigarette. He lit up and said, oh. He said, I never thought I would live to be interviewed in quite such a manner before. 